Okay, thank you guys all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Rabbi Ben Resnick. I'm the rabbi at the Pelham Jewish Center, and uh, one of the, which is one of the partner institutions uh, for this amazing teen collab. Um, I wanna start off by saying hello to everyone from the teen collabs here, and thank you for all the work you do to put this together. Uh, rabbi Cornelia Dalton of WJC, Adam Bender of Shari Tikva, uh, Rachel Mann of Shari Tikva, Rabbi Shoshi Levin Goldberg of Tik. Ezra Hurwitz, also of TIC, uh, Rabbi Ben Goldberg of KTI, Alyssa Berman of Beth L, and Ronit Razanovsky of the JCC of Harrison. Thank you all so much for what uh, you guys are doing and for supporting us um, in this uh, really important program and in, and in the really important conversation tonight. Um, before uh, I introduce our panelists, I always think it's uh, nice to uh, start any Jewish gathering with a little bit of singing. And... Um, I thought we'd sing Kol Alam Kulo, which is something that a lot of Jews have been singing in a lot of different contexts over the last several months, and I think is always appropriate, and so hopefully people know it. And I don't have to use a mic, because my voice is not that good. Kol Alam Kulo Gesher Sar Gesher Tsar Meod Gesher Tsar Meod Kol Haolam Gulo Gesher Tsar Meod Gesher Tsar Meod Um, okay, so as you all know, I hope, or if not surprise, uh, this is a conversation about anti-Semitism on college campuses, which is uh, something I think probably of some concern to everyone in the room, either because you're soon going to be in college, or because you have children in college, or because you work on college campuses, or because you are in fact now in college. Um, and um, I, I, I think this will be a very interesting conversation. We're gonna make time for uh, questions at the end. Uh, before we start, I just wanna thank all of our panelists and introduce them. Uh, first, Ira Glasser, uh, the Chief Executive Director of Hillel at Binghamton. Uh, Ira comes to Hillel, uh, comes to Hillel at Binghamton after an extensive career in Jewish educational leadership, most recently as the Director of Jewish Life and Learning at the Road of Shalom School uh, in New York. Uh, he also taught middle school and Jewish studies there. Uh, prior to that, Ira worked at the JNF, uh, supporting the work of Hillel's around the country through Israel programming, and he has led more than 25 Israel transformative Israel experiences. That is a lot, uh, including the capstone eighth grade a trip at Road of Shalom, uh, JNF's alternative spring break, and Togli Birthright Israel. So welcome, Ira, and thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, introduce and thank Rabbi Alex Salzberg. Uh, Alex, uh, Rabbi Salzberg is the executive director at Townsend University Hillel, and he's originally from Baltimore, uh, spent a gap year on Young Judea's is, uh, year course, and then earned an undergraduate degree from Wesleyan. Uh, after learning his master's uh, degree in Jewish education at Baltimore Hebrew University at Townsend, he was ordained at JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary. And for the next six years, he was the rabbi at the Pelham Jewish Center, where I am now currently the rabbi, um, where he uh, worked with the amazing, the incredible Anna Turkianich. He said it, but I also second it. And uh, he focused on education for all ages, building relationships within the synagogue and between the synagogue and in the wider community. And then 10 years from Baltimore, away from Baltimore was enough, and uh, he's back uh, raising his kids there and at the TU Hillel. So welcome, Alex, and thank you so much. It's really nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, next to my right is Rachel Klein. Um, she uh, joined the Hillels of Westchester team in 2014, 
Uh, prior to her time uh, at Hillel, Rachel served as the Reform Synagogue Director, as a Reform Synagogue Director in New Jersey, a youth group advisor and a teacher. She began her social work career in 2013 as a direct practice social worker on mental health and substance abuse. Uh, her abu her uh, journey from clinical social work to Hillel, prof to Hillel Professional uh, brought her to serve as an assistant child advocate with the, with the state of New York, uh, the state of New Jersey for nearly a decade, where she focused on anti-bullying efforts, uh, childhood lead poisoning, legislative oversight, and individual advocacy. And at least two of those, I think, are very relevant to the conversation about anti-Semitism, maybe more. Um, and uh, she's an award-winning hobby winemaker, which I didn't know until just now. And she currently lives in Stamford, Connecticut with her husband, Brian, a dog, and a uh, cat. And, and uh, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome, Rachel. And finally, our college students, Jeremy Marcus, who is a freshman at Penn State University, at uh, Penn State University uh, from Bethel, and uh, Simone Steingart, who's at Cornell, a senior, and she's also from Bethel. And finally, Max Cohn, who's at City College, a junior, and um, is at City College from uh, Temple Hill Center. So um, thank you all, and thank you all for coming. And uh, I want to get right into questions, because I want to make sure everyone has enough time to speak and that you guys all have enough time to ask questions. And the first question is, and um, Rachel, you and I were talking a little bit about this earlier today when we spoke on the phone, and I'll sort of, I'll give this question to you first off, and then we'll bring in someone else. So I think there's definitely a perception, um, and this is true both in media and I think throughout the Jewish world, uh, at least throughout all the Jewish communities that I've been part of, that something very important has shifted, and uh, not for the better, on college campuses since October 7th. And my first question for you, Rachel, and this is something that hopefully will bring some other people in on as well, is first of all, do you think that that's true? Um, is there something that is really different now than there was before October 7th? Um, and if so, how? And if not, why does that perception exist? Thanks, Rabbi Resnick. Um, I get that a full-throated yes. There has been a seismic shift, but I fully recognize that my lens is coming from a place of Jewish life. Um, do I know that everyone across the campus is feeling the shift the same way that I do? I don't. But I do know that every pocket of campus is feeling the change in climate. And, and climate being the general attitudes on campus. Um, we talk about a positive climate being a place that's healthy and thriving and a negative climate being a place that is more tense and challenging. So we are not in a positive climate right now. Um, prior to October 7th was not a generally positive climate on a lot of campuses for a lot of reasons. But there has been an absolute seismic shift from the Jewish perspective. And my perception on this, thinking back a few years ago, um, around the COVID era, but starting a few years before, there was a, a movement in this country for anti-racism. And we were all reading, Ibrahim Kendi, we were all having these conversations about how to be an anti-racist. And as a social justice human being, I was raised as a reformed Jew, This I feel like social justice is in my veins. I was so grateful through that period for the discomfort that I felt as, as somebody acknowledging my white privilege, I was feeling discomfort, but I felt privilege. Like I had just been invited to dining room conversations that had been happening in, in black households for generations. This was something, you know, we have our own Jewish jokes and you have to be in the tribe to get it. This felt like an invitation into somebody else's private conversation but in a way that gave opportunity for all of us to engage and help. And on October 7th, my pain was remediated ever so slightly by that sense of hope of this might be our anti-racist moment. By the morning of October 9th, that was completely defeated. So I've, I've since been struggling with why there has been such a different response in this moment than there was in the anti-racism moment. Uh, maybe you bring in a student on that question. Do you want to answer? 
Um, hi, I'm Swan. Um, so you're Cornell. For me, the shift has been um, not that the ideology or beliefs didn't exist. Like, I absolutely feel a shift on campus, and I've been on campus for four years, so I've really felt through COVID and what it's been like way before October 7th and, and now. And for me, what I think about and re really uh, comes out to me is that like these ideas and anti-Semitic beliefs exist and they're entrenched and they exist. And it's not like they all of a sudden came into society after October 7th. It's that October 7th was um, for worse for us, but like a, almost like a great tool for people to use that and and be like uh, be more anti-Semitic, I guess. Not the thoughts of an eloquent way of putting it, but right for me, it's not like anti-Semitism barely existed at Cornell, and now it exists. That is not what I think. I think it existed, and this what what this really points out to me is that like we need to constantly be proactive. So like as a student in a high school or in college, like to me, even when times are quiet, I'm thinking. That doesn't mean that there's nothing going on. It means we need to be proactive about how we're educating people and the programs that we're putting on. So if you've been involved in your hell out and you're a leader, like always creating programs, I think it's like a huge uh, critical moment of education for people. Um, and to realize that when things are quiet, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, I want to end on a positive note. Um, I guess what I would say is to feel empowered from this opportunity. I would say like the high school students are going to college to feel empowered to like continue being Jewish leaders. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of work to do, but I also think that we have like a really great cohort of Jewish leaders. Um, and I'm excited for you guys all to be Jewish leaders in college. Um, on a ship, uh, you wanna get in on that? Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Mac. Um, so I definitely, I, I, I have felt it, you know, it's, it's just the national conversation. I, I like to always remind myself of a very, uh, a couple important things whenever it happens, whenever something happens that the, just like any extremist ideology, it's in a fringe minority. Most people that you'll meet won't like have any too strong opinion, both character Jewish, um, like, you know, obviously, again, there's going to be extreme people out there, but that's, that's, that's life that there's, there's 300 something million Americans and 8 million people on this earth. And not every single one of them is going to be loving, passionate, uh, wonderful people. You know, they don't, they don't, I mean, I would have, I, you know, it's, it's, it would be a nice thing to, to ask on uh, college applications. Hey, do you, uh, what are your thoughts on Kabbalah? Uh, but you know, I, and, and that would probably, if that would probably shine a little bit more of a light on, on, and probably exclude some people, uh, from coming to campus, but they don't do that. Um, and, uh, so I'm not, you know, it's, I, I, I always try to remind myself one, that it's an extreme and that, you know, that I have to surround myself with people who aren't going to either you know, have any sort of, any, 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 of this is like so important, any, any, any kind of bigoted belief or like democracy. And I always try to always, and they listen to my template, I always like to see the other side because I have, I always have to tell myself, and this is another thing, I, I have to understand why someone would think that a lot of it is because people are posting Instagram slides and they see an Instagram slide and it says, oh, this thing. And they're like, oh, and then people say, oh, well, that must be true because it's in an Instagram slide uh, it, it, on someone's story. And, you know, so a lot of people just get their get their views from Instagram slides and then on people, there's on the, like, on people's stories. So I'm not, you know, it, it, if that's where they're getting it from, it's like, you know, then I have to tell myself they don't have an informed opinion. And I'm not, I, I remember there is, um, I'll end on this, uh, uh, this and another thing, uh, a quote, and it's a very important quote. Uh, you will, uh, I don't know who said it, but you are not entitled to your opinion. You are only entitled to your informed opinion. No one is entitled to be ignorant. And that's why, I, you know, I, I always try to see who is ignorant. I try not to be ignorant of myself to any belief. 
um, except hateful, negative ones. And I, you know, with my friends, I always try to, you know, engage them and, you know, get them to see that, you know, our side. And, you know, my friends said, I don't believe in the, you know, Israel should exist because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a nate and not a nation state, it's an ethno state. That's what he said, an ethno state. And I said, okay. And then, like, I was like, later, like, Saudi Arabia is not going to stay. And then she said, well, you know what? I, I guess I don't believe that Saudi Arabia should be an ethno state. And I said, that is great. Why? Because if we're going to have an opinion, we should have an opinion about it. We should, we should not be hypocritical. We should, you know, if we're, if, if someone, if your friends going to believe that Israel shouldn't exist because it's an ethno state, they shouldn't believe that any ethno state should exist. There's a lot of ethno states. Uh, yeah. in that area so um and if someone's hypocritical they do, don't be friends with them there's so many you'd be a lot of you will go to colleges with tens of thousands of kids so find find your group even if they don't even if they don't have the exact same thing as you make sure that you know and sometimes you just don't have to talk about it just to be friends and talk about other stuff good um thank you i want to um, shift the conversation a little bit, and this is related a little bit to something Max said. Um, another question was, I'm going to ask, I'm going to bring some of the people who are on online, and we'll definitely, we're going to get to Ira too, of course. Um, we have a lot of panelists with, uh, and we want to make sure everyone gets to talk. Um, so, um, Max, you mentioned um, sort of at one point, sort of hearing, you want to hear other people's perspectives. And um, the, the question I was going to ask was, how, and you can answer this one if you want, uh, Rabbi Salzberg. I'll give you this one. Um, how, you know, how, give me a concrete example of a way that anti-Semitism impacted your work over the last several months and how you and your students responded. Um, so that's a piece of the question. But I want to shift it sort of based a little bit on what Max said about sort of how how much are you thinking about hearing other people's narratives? I'll say, and I'll say, this is not about hearing uh, uh, Ben Resnick, but I'll say that it is one of the challenges for me over the last several months. I really have a difficult time accessing other, the other narrative, let's say. I have a difficult time with it. I, I am very comfortable with mine, and I have a very comfortable time, a very difficult time accessing sort of the other side of the narrative. And I'm curious how you see that right now and to what extent you're helping your students do that. And do you think we need to help our students do that? Listen, you don't ask me to swallow quiet questions. Never. Sorry, to see so many of you, you, you that I do recognize. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming together for the support of that a conversation. Um, and uh, Rabbi Resnick putting this together, I just want to give an extra shout out to Rabbi Dalton, Rabbi Levin Goldberg, and Rabbi Goldberg, who I actually spent the entire week with. So if you come from their shoals, you know that they're coming home really, really energized for a fantastic week of rabbinic gathering. Um, and I think your rabbis are incredible. Um, I love that I got to spend time with those three specific ones. Um, so to your question, I think there have been certainly small instances of anti-Semitism, individual instances of anti-Semitism on Towson's campus. I think that there have been a decently large number of anti-Israel activity on campus, and a lot of the work that we've been doing is helping everyone, the administration and our students especially, and also our students' parents, find where that line is between anti-Israel and anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, um, we have had anti-Israel rallies and vigils and die-ins on campus. Um, and for the most part, for the most part, they were political. And while I certainly could not agree with their narrative, I could not agree with anything they were saying, they were expressing political opinions, and college is a space where people get to express their political opinions. They get to say what they want, whether I agree with that or not, honestly, whether they're right or they're wrong, and that's what happens. Um, and when they stray, intentionally or unintentionally, from anti-Israel into anti-Semitism, that's when we need to act more, more significantly. Um, 
when the anti-Israel rallies happen, we as a as a Hillel always make sure to check in with our students, to gather our students, and to provide our students with some other programming, some other thing for them to do so that they didn't feel isolated. Um, more often than not, our students were feeling frightened because they were feeling alone. And when they came together, they felt stronger. We had students who were were staying in their rooms because they were afraid to go out. But when they finally did come out and come to the NLL space, they suddenly realized that the world wasn't quite as scary as it seemed from the confines of their four walls. We had students who became deeply engaged in Hillel work because that was the way that they could feel safe. Um, the way that we have been working on engagement with anti-Semitism was not something that we started doing on October 7th. October 7th wasn't the day to start fighting anti-Semitism. The day to start fighting anti-Semitism was, was before October 6th. Um, and so we been building relationships with other groups and individuals on campus so that they can be allies. Um, as Rachel said, we be our campuses are all with the eye, diversity, equity. But as she said also, October 7th was a day where we realized that we aren't always included in that in the way that we, we hoped that we would. And so a lot of our work is with the administration to and then as you think it taking the end about how this is or isn't anti-Semitism, about how this does impact the Jewish community in a way that outsiders might not understand. Um, we are working on building those bridges both before October 7th and, and since it's very different. Or as it engages with narratives, that I'm hoping is the work of the spring semester. Um, in the fall semester, we were very protective of ourselves and of our feeling of security. Um, and I'm hoping and I'm beginning conversation with the president of our university and with the advisor to the Muslim Student Union about finding ways for certain students who are ready to have the conversations in both groups to be able to talk to one another. Because what I've been hearing both from this advisor to the Muslim Student Association and from our university president is you Jewish students are feeling unsafe, they're feeling frightened, um, and so are the Muslims. If everyone is scared, the one option is for everyone to retreat and to be offended to, to oppose anyone who is outside of their camp. And the other option is for us to talk to each other, to understand why the other person is afraid, and to be able to grow, move forward together. Um, because that that's the way they need to change things, both on campus and as our students graduate and become leaders of the world, in the wider world. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that work will be able to, to happen, that our students have the resilience to be able to do it. I think that they do. I believe that they do. Um, but I can't, I can't say for sure that it will work yet because we're starting once the semester begins again. Jeremy, uh, are you, just following up a little bit, this question wasn't on the pre-questions, so you have no, you have no advanced warning. But I'm gonna throw it at you anyways. I think you can handle it. Um, do you? And you could speak for yourself. You could speak for your friend group or your, your sense of campus. Do you feel like Jewish students on campus are ready to do the work that Rabbi Salzberg was describing about sort of hearing other narratives and talking? Like, do you, do you have substantive conversations with people you feel like you disagree with over the last? you know, several weeks and months, or do you feel like you've mostly been wanting to be with people that are like-minded? And I want to, by the way, preface, I think both answers are okay. I want to say that I, my opinion is both answers are okay, but. Yeah, uh, um, so I, so I have an international issues major. Um, this has been uh, something that I've been very interested in, like way before October 7th. Um, and something gun. I just kind of studied up my jury started. I don't know, you know, like a history guy. So, but, um, the whole conflict and anti-Semitism has been something I've looked at for like semi grade, basically. Um, and I think it's a really, uh, I, I, it's a good, uh, point mentioning like seeing the other side. Um, because a lot of people, uh, a lot of my really good friends, especially, uh, Tim Holm actually cannot see the other side also. Um, and it's something that it's hard to have some 
on top of a station with someone. Um, as like, I mean, as a Jewish person, I guess I'm like, like I have my beliefs about Israel and anti-Semitism and stuff. Um, and a lot of, uh, but I'm also able to see and just had my interest in, um, but I had, uh, conversations with my friend the whole and, uh, they're talking about some, I don't know, like your anti-Israel rally and they come, but just assume that Israel is this perfect thing and did nothing wrong. And I well aware that, oh, Israel has its flaws, but so had its little right to exist. And some people, a lot of my friends believe that it has its flaws. Um, and, uh, so I, I'm definitely to see the other side. Um, and it's important to acknowledge the other side, regardless of what you agree or disagree with. Uh, it's really, it, it kind of just comes down to whether uh, the lies are blurred between anti Semitism and being anti Israel, um, because they should be two different things. Uh, but to a lot of people, uh, it blends in. And uh, sometimes uh, people already have the pre existing anti Semitism, and the power is just coming out by showing, by saying that they're in a pantheon Israel, when they start going off the edge and all of a sudden they'll like, wait a second, you're just referring to the religion. I am. So yeah, um, at campus, um, I'd say that, um, I, I had a conversation with, um, we have the leaders at Halo, um, and that was, uh, that was more of a better conversation though. Um, because she, is one of the few people that I met that was truly able to see the other side. And actually I'm very, very similar viewpoints to make, uh, which made me feel like pretty good. Um, going that, uh, there are people that I can see the other side and you really disagree at some things and worry of others. Um, and so that definitely gave me like, a, a bit of hope. Uh, these people will have been very one sided so far, regardless of what you will leave to. Um, so that, that definitely, uh, was really fair. Um, for like some of my other friends here, uh, like I, I have plenty of Israeli friends and if they have close connections and ties, uh, men, but they're choosing to only consume like red media, which of course is going to see your, your, your perspective. Like, um, so, I mean, I'm lucky that I don't have such a close connection that I'm actually, I just, I call already close to both sides the spectrum really remember I can find in different news sources. Um, so I'm taking the edge of that. Um, but in Safari, uh, I do this has been creating one time in between our my friends of hmm. uh, what they say. Thanks, Jeremy. I mean, uh, so I want to pick up on, uh, on something uh, Rabbi Salzburg said and something that Jeremy said and ask Ira uh, this question first. <clears throat> it's a question I, I'm going to ask both the professionals and the students, and I, has, I don't know which one I should ask first, but I'm going to ask Ira because Ira hasn't talked yet. Um, Jeremy mentioned a very valuable conversation I think you had with a Hillel director and, and, and Rabbi Salzberg mentioned that initially, you know, people were, you know, afraid to come out and then they actually, when they cut the Hillel, they're like, oh, it's actually good to be together. And I think, um, this question is pretty much a version of a question that I shared with all of you before, which is, um, what's the value proposition for Hillel's right now? What do you think as a Hillel leader, what do you think your students need to hear from you and what do you want to tell them about the present moment or about the future and then students i'm going to ask in a little while well what what do you feel like you need from your rabbis and teachers and and people that you uh you know look to for answers thank you um i i'm gonna tie in and build on something that rabbi salzberg said um in this answer and i think there are there are two levels to the value proposition of Hillel. One is um, we are a representative of the Jewish community on campus. And we, at least in the six months that I've been at Binghamton, um, I've been able to, out of necessity, forge relationships with senior university administrators because they recognize, on the one hand, they need our help in trying to keep the campus climate as low as possible. And we also need their help to keep the campus climate as low as possible. So in terms of a partner and in terms of a representative of the Jewish community, I think that is one of those value propositions. 
uh, as far as the student, as far as the student body goes, we are that place for Jewish students. I think one of the beauties of Hillel is that we are a pluralistic Jewish organization. So in as many ways as we can be Big Ten Judaism, we are that, that place that students can come and explore and really d understand for themselves what their Jewish identity is, what their, give them leadership opportunities that will certainly shape their futures as both Jewish professionals, as also Jewish future, hopefully Jewish lay leaders, as members of communities, as professionals in, in, in the real world outside of college. Um, and I also think that we have to continue to operate as though, I'm going to riff on a David Ben-Gurion quote, we have to operate as though October 7th did not happen, and we also have to continue to operate given the fact that October 7th did happen. So how are we meeting students when, when events like October, when the atrocities of October 7th happen, how are we meeting students when they need us? And at the same time, how are we giving them the avenues to explore and to develop and to connect with one another? That in and of itself is the, is the value proposition. Um, I can think of any number of, I can think of myself as a student at, at Hillel at Binghamton. I can think of my peer group who were involved in Hillel. And I could think of any number of students who are currently involved in Hillel and the ways in which that they get to learn more about themselves through any number of activities outside of the academic classes, including informal learning opportunities that we have, social activities that we have, whatever it may be, that gives them that space to better understand themselves. Um, what I would want to tell students is we are here for you. And the door is open. The door will always be open, except for when the office door, unfortunately, is closed and the professionals go home. But even then, the door is there. And when, the, when you're not going to necessarily feel comfortable to come to the door, our professionals will find a way to bring the door to you because that is the work that we do. That is why we have the, the unique and the special professionals that we do and the, the passionate professionals that we do. And that's also why we have the courageous and resilient student leaders that we do because they also care about the mission and they also care about the uninvolved Jewish students on campus because the campus environment, whether it is safe or, or uneasy for Jews, it's going to impact you whether you are, are involved or not. Um, to build on really quickly a question that you had asked about perspectives, um, one thing that I found in looking for the spring semester, we're planning on bringing a duo of speakers from an organization in Israel that brings an Israeli and a Palestinian together to speak together. And when this came to when this came to me as an opportunity, actually, they're also going to Cornell, um, as far as I understand more on that afterwards. Um, when this opportunity came to me, I said, I'm 100 percent in on this and I don't want to partner with individual student organizations. I want to partner with the student affairs department within the university. I want to partner with the multicultural center of the university. I want to partner with the university interface center. I want to partner with the bigger university organizations because I know that those are the, the articulated goals of the university is to be able to bring people together and engage in difficult dialogue um, to be able to learn and challenge one's orthodoxy. And that's where that learning can take place. And I'm really proud of the fact that we can be uh, a vehicle to make that happen on our campus. Um, so bring, going back to your question of the value proposition, I think being able to offer and being a leader within the university campus community to offer those types of programs, that right there is part of um, our value proposition. Um, Simone, what are you looking for from your uh, leaders or rabbis or teachers at this point? Really good question. Um, because I'm a senior and I was just vice president of Hillel, I kind of feel like sometimes I'm put up by the leadership side and I'm like, we, at, I kind of say the same thing you just said. I said, we at Hillel are here for you. Um, so it's actually really interesting to like kind of put me in the student side, even though I feel more sometimes closer to the staff side. Um, I was thinking a little bit just about like Hillel on campus. I don't know if this will exactly answer the question, but I think it's an interesting story. Um, we had, I had a, we had a student who reached out to me, um, uh, we have a group, some WhatsApp group chat 
uh, for just any Jews on campus that want to be in it. Just about like, you know, Jewish events that are happening, Chabad Post, Tila Post, just kind of like, here's what's happening on campus, um, this overall large group chat. Somebody private messaged me and said that they feel that a lot of the Hillel leaders on um, in this group chat, but this group chat isn't uh, like isn't affiliated with Hillel or an organization. It just like me and my friend were like, this should be a thing at Cornell. So we reached out and said, I feel like a lot of the Hillel leaders have this one narrative. Um, and as a student who affiliates with Student for Justice in Palestine, SJP, which is, uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone has heard of that organization on campus. I don't really feel so comfortable with Hillel. So can you please clarify what Hillel's like stance is? Um, I'll say completely honestly, this was like so difficult for me. Like for me, and maybe there's people in this room who disagree with that, SJP is a big no-no. Um, right? They're like, like we 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 try to work with them, and it's really hard. We've never we can't work with, we cannot work with them. Um, dialogue does not happen. It's just very, very difficult. Um so when a student comes and says, I don't feel comfortable in Hillel, and I'm part of this organization that I personally, Simone, really, really disagree with, like, what do we do? So I think the interesting part of the uh, piece Hillel plays and what they should continue to do, um, what my, the, our executive director and our staff told me, um, they said, listen, Hillel has values and Hillel has uh, like a, a, a statement. And Hillel is a Zionist organization. And we're not going to stop being a Zionist organization. So we have to meet all students where they are. And we have to meet all, um, everyone where they're at in their beliefs. And we're not going to stop being a Zionist organization because people aren't comfortable with that. That being said, people should feel comfortable coming to Jewish events, even if they don't agree with you on Israel Matters. That was a really hard thing for me to accept. Um, not like people are so different from me. I can, I, I feel like I'm painting, I'm painting myself as this, you know, super right wing individual, and I'm not. I'm, I'm open, but it's really hard to be like, let's bring someone who's in this like almost enemy organization, and um, it's my job as a leader now to make them feel comfortable. I'm like, well, I don't feel comfortable, right? How does that work? But I think that's the essence of it is that Hillel has a value and the values of our Hillel at Brown Hill, and I think Hillel International, but I'm sure Rachel could speak more on that, mm -hmm. is we're a Zionist organization. Mm -hmm. So the so the events that we're going to have will have different, spe um, different degree of events, but at the core, we're a Zionist organization. And an individual who affiliates with SJP should not feel uncomfortable coming to Friday night dinner. It, this is that's what I believe. I think there's people who don't agree with me on that, um, and it took me a really long time to kind of think about that and and think about it through my head. But I also think of kind of what Jeremy was saying is like there's there's a lot of there's a lot more nuance, um, and I still feel like a proud Zionist, and I right. I just think it's a it's very complicated, but I think that's a little bit of insight on like what Hillel has done, at least for me personally. That's actually been extremely helpful um while maintaining my like zionist core and like my uh kind of safeguarding my beliefs that makes sense fine uh rachel's gonna respond to one thing and then uh, we'll get back to yeah. yeah um so I, i'm gonna uh get to some of the things that that simone said and and i i really like you and i hope that this um is received from a place of love when i get to it so the the value proposition as i see it is gam for gam. it is it is both can be um hillel is um unfortunately not a zionist organization this has been an internal battle in hillel for many many years the struggle between being a true big tent organization and drawing a line in regards to Israel has been, I'm letting you all in on the family secret. This has been a battle within Hillel forever. We do have Israel guidelines, but every Hillel is independent. So we all make our own decisions. I'm, I'm going to use a, another Hillel as an example, the Hillels of, of Cleveland. 
after October 7th and before October 7th, they had their own Israel mission statement that defined who they were. Oberlin College is within the Hillel's of Cleveland system. Oberlin College very much disagreed with the Cleveland Hillel's, their mother Hillel's. They disagreed with a very strong pro-Israel position. They saw it as too far to the right. So within the Hillel movement, the red line, as far as, as I see it and as far as it exists at our Hillel's, is that Israel has a right to exist. Full stop. Whether you identify as a Zionist is not my concern. We can always have those questions, those conversations, and we do have those conversations. But we have, um, in Westchester, most of the colleges that we have are liberal arts with the emphasis on the liberal. So... Our, our biggest challenge, um, even before October 7th, was making sure that the student who's Jewish, who maybe feel, is feeling drawn to SJP, has an alternative place to go. So we've had to, we've had a lot of really difficult conversations internally and uh, externally with students. This is really the, the crux of the issue. Um, for, for us, in Westchester, one piece that I want to highlight for folks is since October 7th, it feels like other people have defined who Hillel is. And that's made it really challenging. So we've been reaching out to every student, um, every student within our network and having that conversation of how are your head and heart right now? How are you doing? How are you feeling? And in the, I wasn't going to talk about the situation, but I will now. In, in one of the most concerning situations, one of our student interns, this was our Jewish Learning Fellowship intern, a stellar Jewish student. When I reached out to her, she said, I'm really sorry. I need to quit my internship because I don't agree with the Hillel position on Israel. And I said, can you please tell me what the Hillel position on Israel is? And she said, well, that Israel's right. And I don't agree with that. I don't always agree with that either. I, I, I was really um, touched by what Jeremy was saying because as a professional, I feel a lot of the same things as my students do. I am proudly pro-Israel. I'm also in support of Palestinian dignity and self-determination. And that's the choice that we make at my Hillel. And that's the choice that a lot of Hillels have had to make. We are pro-Israel. But the, the definition and the, the label of Zionism has caused such friction that we've had to get so much more nuanced. So the value proposition really is that all can be within Hillel. Um, and I want to get I want to get back, bring everyone back in. And I want I do want to move us along because I want to make sure we have time for some questions from you guys. And I want to um, uh, get both Jeremy and. Um, get Jeremy and Max back in and also Rabbi Salzberg. Um, so this is a, a slightly different question. I want to, we've got uh, side, not sidetracked exactly, but we we're talking about Israel and which is of course very important, but actually what this panel is, was, it was conceived of as a panel about anti-Semitism on American campuses. And okay, we all, maybe this describes everyone in the room, it certainly describes, I think all of the panelists, we all care very deeply about Israel, we have Israel but we are Americans at the moment for the time being. And um, so I want to shift us back to sort of American campuses and anti-Semitism in America. Um, and this is uh, this is for the stu This is for the students. Um, what makes you feel hopeful about the future of Jewish life on campus? Ever? Oh my God! Oh my God! I'm so hopeful. I'm so hopeful in so many ways. I'm so hopeful because uh, I'm so hopeful because a lot of a lot like like we have a similar lead chat at city college we have all gotten like so much closer like you know once you get into it with your jewish friends and then you're starting to make jewish jokes and then you know you're it's snowballing and you're sharing stuff and you're hanging out all the time like it's it's really like you know hello is real like Halo has brought me you know to meet so many uh jewish students who i wouldn't have normally met um otherwise so it's 
I'm I'm hopeful in many ways, and I'm hopeful because you know there's because of the nuances and because of the because of the you know the disagree like that's literally like you know the essence of who we are as Jews. We disagree on so much stuff, and we can never agree on anything. Um, that's like the one constant we have in our religion. Uh, uh, so it's like you know I love disagreeing with people on stuff, Israel or otherwise, and I I, I think I spent. How long was it? It must have been like over two hours talking with just one of my uh, co, I'm a board member, e-board member, I'm the Shabbat coordinator. I talked with like, I think another e-board member for like over two hours about Israel and anti-Semitism and hostages and et cetera, et cetera. And it was just like, it was just an amazing uh, experience because, you know, sometimes, and you'll have to do this with your Arab peers or Palestinian peers and or just American peers, but you can have to agree to disagree sometimes. Jer uh, Jeremy, uh, uh, maybe something, maybe a, something a minute or two about what you're hopeful about, and then I have one more question that I like to ask all the professionals, and then we'll open it up. Yeah, uh, how am extremely hopeful um, because uh, first off, uh, it already hasn't even been that bad at Penn State. I know, especially at Ivy League schools. Uh, as I said with Hislip, has been uh, really prevalent and a horrible thing. Uh, Penn State has actually kept it pretty up in wraps. Um, and I think it just, it's because of how passionate our hell on Shabbat is, especially our Shabbat. But uh, Shabbat has been like the most passionate organization on campus, like regardless of being Jewish or not. Like just, you see Chabad everywhere. You see they are in every building. Uh, very fun that kind of day were lighting and the balls. Um, um, they invite people uh, all the way to the house here. Oh, that's like every single day. Uh, and well, is also it, they're still doing their thing. They have, they just elected a new board, so they're doing well. Um, so not only am I hopeful, uh, all of them, but I also know that, uh, especially at Penn State. That fits in a real good position um, because it just it really comes down to uh, how much our leaders care uh, and how much they're good for um, and they really care here um, and like I mean even like a week after October 7th like Chabad was be safe Caitlin everyone ventured down and Chabad is off campus so it's like tw it's a 20 minute walk for most people um, and uh, it was mentioned before that like a lot of people want to like stay in it. Really though, hide in the end of the health safety going out when everyone went out to Shabbat. It when we had 150 people for Shabbat and then like right after, and we thought it was going to be the lowest attendance Shabbat of the year. It was actually the highest. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that example for the, some Ivy Leagues and some other universities, but at least at Penn State, um, it's been really sure. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so this is my last question, and then we're going to open it up and hopefully try to keep it for you guys. So we have 15 minutes for questions, so you know, keep your answers to about a minute and a half, something like that. Uh, this is a question about predicting the future, which uh, none of us are totally blessed with that ability yet, um, not even the rabbis. Um, but and, I, and I'm thinking about this because I, there's a lot of people in the room who have taken some time out of their Thursday night who are not going to be who are not in college yet, but might be in college in five years, something like that. Um, uh, and my question is, so, and maybe I should have start with, because I don't know how helpful this will be or not, but maybe I should have started, flip these in the order. But where do you think we'll be in five years, 10 years, compared to where we are today? And and, and how are we going to get there? And, and um, Alex, uh, Rabbi Salzberg, I'll ask you to weigh in first. I'm not going to answer your question directly, um, or I will, and then explain why. Um, I have no idea where it will be five or ten years, but I want to go back to your last question, which and why, which will explain why that doesn't terrify me. Um, I don't know where we're going to be in five or ten years, but I have such hope around what my current students are doing and the identity that they are forming that they will carry us both on college campus while we're there and then 
if we're talking 10 years as they are going out into the world and shaping the world as adults in the world, that they will, will do it with passion and they will do it with concern that wherever they take us in 10 years is going to be incredible. Our students are more connected to the muted meeting now than they ever work for. As Jeremy was just saying, people have come out since October 7th. Jewish members of the community have come out at End State. It was Chabad. Chabad and Hillel, both on, on campuses around the country, are are doing incredible work to support students, and students are are connecting to NAS in a way that they never have before. The the world really does feel like it's in flux right now. And our students, this generation is coming, forging their 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 identity, the one that they will hold them for the rest of their lives. As the world is in flux, you're doing it in a way that is prioritizing Jewish identity and Jewish connection. And, and these students are going to help us find our way out of this mess that we find ourselves in. Our freshmen showed up to campus thinking that they were going to come to a Shabbat once in a while or the high holidays once in a while. We spoke to a parent who said, you'll probably see him at all. And he is out publicly Jewish every day of the week, writing letters to the administration, speaking to reporters and news outlets and joining the NLL eBoard. eBoard is what we call our board, the executive board. I'm not really sure why, but apparently it's universal across LLs. Um, and he is this incredible leader and he's stepped out on canvas over an entire semester. I mean, at seven more semester, we'll broke. Oh, boy. And, and, and develop into someone. You know, that's not what causes me to sleep. What causes me to sleep is what might happen tomorrow. But these students are amazing. And I trust that the students in that room who took the time out of the Thursday night, and as he said, Rabbi Resnick, to, to have this conversation are going to be just as passionate and just as engaged and just as incredible. So I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm going to echo some of what Rabbi Salzberg said, and I, it makes me think of uh, what Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs says as Judaism's gift to the world is hope. And I actually think about your question, not about, I think about college campuses in five to 10 years. And I look at this room at all of the teens who are here, and you are what give, at least me as a professional, hope for what lays, lays ahead in the future. Um, I, Rachel and I took part in a similar talk the other night um, with another group of teens and their parents. And similarly, considering how many people have showed up in to two different events, in one week gives me hope. This is my third one this week, so it's more. Yeah. All right. So Rachel, Rachel's winning by one point so far. Um, and I also love, and having just come from the Jewish day school world, and I look at Anna and I know the type of education that students who are going to be in college in 10 years are getting in the day school world. I'm familiar with the trends that are, that are happening and the forces that are shaping Jewish day school education today. And that also gives me a tremendous amount of hope. So I think that one thing that has come out of this is there's a tenacity, there's a resilience, and there's a courage of young Jewish people, whether they are 10 years old or whether they are 20 years old. And that gives a lot of promise and a lot of hope for what will happen or what will be in 2028. Or, or sorry, 2029, my mind is still in 2023, in 2029, or even in 2034. So the, the mission of Hillel is to enrich the lives of Jewish college students so they may enrich the Jewish people in the world. Um, that gives me hope. I echo everything that my esteemed colleague said. And I've also never felt more hopeful. I've been in this job for 10 years. I've been a Jewish communal professional for more than 20 years. I've never felt more hopeful. I've never felt more purposeful. And along with all of my students and my staff, I've never been more uncomfortable. But I'm reminded of something that I learned from a very dear colleague, and that is comfort is not a Jewish value. So this moment of being in discomfort and leaning into that discomfort 
and Hillel being a place. We talk a lot about wellness and comfort and respite, and this is what Hillel is. It is also the place to come and have some really difficult conversations. And that was true before October 6th or October 7th. Um, so I'm hopeful and purposeful. I'm also, again, um, like Ira said, um, the thought of the students who are on campus today being tomorrow's Jewish communal professionals gives me pride to the point of tears. And I'm not a crier. It's an extraordinary thing to think that five years from now, some of my former students are co will be colleagues. And we see this happen. I, you just saw it happen in front of you. So I, I want to leave with that sort of seed of you're all on a path. You're on your own path. But those paths have similar steps. You're going to step into college. You're going to step into a career. You're going to step into relationships. I encourage you all, lean into the discomfort in every one of those steps, and you will come out more enriched than you went in. And also, don't just count Jewish communal work. I see. Oh. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify what I said earlier, because I actually, I really appreciate your comment, Rachel, and I actually don't think what we were saying was at odds. It was, I actually, I think you just articulated better than me, <laughs> um, which I do appreciate. But the point of my story was to show you kind of a vulnerable moment in me as an individual and beliefs that I have, very strong beliefs that I have based on how I grew up. Um, and my point was that the power of Hillel is to kind of not make me change my beliefs, but kind of alter my perspective. Whereas before I might have been like, I can't deal with anyone who thinks this complete opposite of me. And now I think very much we're going to be different. There's going to be places where I want to do dialogue in and people that I want to engage in dialogue and places where I don't. And the beauty of the Jewish community is that there's a place for everyone. And that's something re that's really, really hard, um, can be really hard to kind of accept as an individual. Um, so I think just, I just wanted to reiterate that point that I think it was about the role of Hillel in making you uncomfortable in whatever way that is. And not and it's not changing my beliefs, but it's altering my perspective, which I appreciate. That's way better than I said. <laughs> uh, we have about uh, a little less than 10 minutes left, so maybe two or three questions. Yes. Uh, why don't you come up and uh, use the mic and... Oh, hi, Rizzo. Oh, I'm just wondering, um, on, for the students on campus, um, have you ever experienced SC Senatism? Has anyone said anything blatantly anti-Semitic directly to you? And if so, how did you handle that? Okay, good. Specific examples. Yeah, thank you for uh, asking that question again, Rizzo. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, it's... it's it, it's a lot of anti-Israel stuff, so then it gets like, you know, it's like, ugh, it's like, you know, there's so much, you know, I've heard, uh, of course, in a, it's in my class, it was a film production class, I'm a film major, and uh, we were, they were having their protest during my class, and I was just like hearing like, and I'm like, someone asked me like, what, what are they, uh, wh what is that, what are they chanting for, and I'm like, oh, you know, there's, you know, chanting for the, yeah, the white people, um, and, uh, and he's like, oh, uh, and it's like, you know, I mean, again, it's like, it, you know, it's a, it's for most, like I, I, I was in it literally, oh my God, like yesterday I was like, uh, someone said, oh, I'm going to go to, I was in a group conversation. Oh, I'm going to go. I wouldn't, I would, uh, in a group conversation, so, someone said like, oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to engage in some, I'm going to buy this brand. I forget what it was. And then, like, my friend said, like, oh, well, you know, they support Israel. And it got, like, really awkward. Um, no no one was Jewish. It was just, like, I had one friend, like, who served, like, told me, like, and I'm, like, God bless her. Like, she said, like, I don't know anything about this conflict. And I don't, I'm not going to pretend to know anything. And you know what? That's amazing. Because it's, like, you know, it's, for all the anti-Semitism that's out there, for all the discussions about Israel, like we're on American college campuses, we're five thousand miles from this place. Unless you're going into politics, we don't, we will not have 
any control over this, uh, like politically. So it's like, no one needs to have an opinion about this and no one, no one needs to know everything about it. If you want to, that's great. And it's like, you know, but like, you know, it's, it's, no one needs to be able to solve it because it's been 75 freaking years and there still is no solution. So if you think, or, or your friend thinks that they can just solve it without uh, violence or, you know, and a lot of the solutions that they say are very violent. It's like, you know, we're not going to be able to solve this with, like, we, personally, we're not going to be able to solve this. And the only thing that we can, like, solve or have control over is, like, I guess, like, lessening bigotry, lessening anti-Semitism, which... Um, I am hopeful that, that you all can, uh, that can accomplish, uh, just to, just to get people to have a more nuanced view to get both sides, which means getting our side. Any other questions? Thank you. I actually, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I think to the question of, I, though I'm not a student, um, anymore, I can say one thing that some of the things that I've heard on my campus, um, I think that I've, I, I've heard and seen um, anything from chalking to flyers to rhetoric espoused at protests. And I think the one thing that is actually really important for the teens, especially in the room, to know and to, edu and to be educated on is where, when, how, and why anti-Zionist rhetoric either flirts with or is a direct manifestation of a classical anti-Semitic tropes. Whether that be, and looking at different models, whether it's, um, you know, Matan Sharansky has the three Ds, uh, which, we can, which I'm not going to get into now. Rabbi Jill Jacobs has another model. Um, there are, and one thing that came up in our campus and you had mentioned this earlier of um, of Israel committing genocide when there were or the the accusation and this is particularly timely given today's um, hearing at the Hague when that rhetoric came up on campus I as a professional felt really comfortable reaching out to the university administration and explaining very clearly why that language is flirting with, and I know that there are colleagues of mine that would disagree with me on this because they would say that is outright anti-Semitic, but I was trying to, you know, go a little bit softer on that and say, this is, this is the, this is why this rhetoric is flirting with the blood libel. This is why this language is particularly hurtful and harmful to the Jewish community on campus. And to be able to have the words and the, and the, and the understanding to be able to do so is something that is incredibly is incredibly empowering both for me as a professional, but I would say even more so for when my students can be able to do that uh, when they are faced with when they are faced with anti-Israel or anti, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist, and being able to challenge that right then and there, um, I think not only takes a tremendous amount of courage, but I think it also defangs some of that argument um, at the outset. You're the last word, yeah. Uh, to the question of specific anti-Semitism, I can speak for the six colleges and universities that I oversee in Westchester. The answer is yes. Prior to October 7th, we averaged 1.5 anti-Semitic incidents a year. Might be a swastika carved in a table in a dining hall or found in a bathroom or a comment that was made um, either online or in person. 1.5 per year for the last 10 years. We had one prior to October 7th, so I had a sense that this might be a little bit bigger. Since October 7th, two cases have been referred to the DA for a hate crime review. Seven cases across our six campuses of clear anti-Semitism have occurred. And uh, this was published in the New York Times and the Forward and JTA, so I'm comfortable sharing it here. Uh, we are in partnership with Hillel International. We are pursuing a Title VI action against Sarah Lawrence College for inequitable educational opportunity, specifically that there has been a disparate treatment of a segment of Jewish students on that campus. So yes, here. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Rabbi Salzberg and Jeremy and uh, Ira and Rachel and Max and Simone for 
a really, really rich and I think important conversation. I want to thank particularly all of our students uh, for giving up some of their Thursday night to be out here, Kol um, And uh, thank you. you. Uh, and uh, then thank you to Anna for putting this together. And uh, thank you to everyone and the JCC. Was it? And Bobby. And yes, and thank you to everyone who helped make the Colette Teen Collab happen. Um, we thought we would close in just a little while, uh, in just a few minutes with Hatikva. Uh, before we do, is Alyssa Berman, uh, does anyone want to speak a little bit about the Teen Collab and just sort of what we're doing? Or Anna, do you want to? Go, go ahead, yeah. Hi, so we're starting our second trimester of the Teen Collab. It's now... Uh, Every Thursday uh, at 6.30 p.m., you're going to have um, a little dinner. My, uh, my group will be um, working with me on a Israeli series called the Shababnikin. Uh, I don't know if you know them. Uh, it's, so, it's, ama it's an amazing series. Right. And we're going to learn a lot about uh, Israeli society and especially the Haredi uh, Haredi in uh, Israeli society, and I'm looking forward. So I hope I'll get to see there you there. And I don't know if anyone else would have got like Ezra. You, yeah. Uh, talking about having students become Jewish communal. This young man here was my student of Jewish history in eighth grade, and suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so proud. <laughs> okay, so you can have give you a shout out. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming and everyone that could be with us online and to all of our panelists, students, and Jewish professionals, thank you. As someone who was in college not too, too long ago, I can say that this is going to be a part of life and the fact that you are coming and educating yourself and showing, demonstrating willingness to be a part of community and really uh, invest time and effort and intellectual energies in how we can actively discuss it and be advocates. I, I think it's such a phenomenal thing. And although it was a couple of years since our Jewish history class in eighth grade, Jewish education, Jewish community, I can say, at least in my experience, I didn't expect for it to perforate through my life as much as it has. If I was talking to myself as a freshman in college, I went to Hillel a couple of times. I went to Chabad a couple of times. But now, a couple of years later, I sit with my wife, who I met in Jewish day school, and who's working in the Department of Education in New York. And I can see that there's so much discussion happening at different educational levels. And if you can just authentically interact and really be present, both listening and also having a willingness to say things that might make your conversational partner uncomfortable or be uncomfortable yourself, that's such a powerful and worthwhile thing. And I really love that idea that there's no Jewish virtue in being comfortable. Um, I certainly think that we should strive to not be uncomfortable forever, but to really be okay with finding our way in the world, even if that's not necessarily clear all the time. So again, Anna, uh, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, and Team Club is great. And uh, let's uh, rise for a team. Oh.
Thanks for coming, everyone.